And to bring us through this is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Waterloo. He is a fellow of the IEEE, a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the Engineering Institute of Canada. He was also the recipient of the 2014 Professional Engineers Ontario Engineering Medal for Research and Development and also the 2019 IEEE Canada AGL McNaughton Gold Medal Award. Now he holds 42 US and Canadian patents and more than 400 refereed publications to his credit. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Professor Rafat Mansora. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, Today, I'm going to talk about exciting new technology for microwave and millimeter wave switches. Uh, it's phase change material based switches and their application in microwave and millimeter wave applications. So, the outline of my talk I'm going to talk first about the switch technology in general and its applications. And then I will address what is BCM technology the phase change material switch technology. And then I will show you some examples of millimeter wave PCM switches. Then I'll show you many examples of devices we built over the past years using PCM technology. Okay, so the examples of the devices I'm going to, do, to discuss today, multi-port switches and switch matrices, switch capacitors, reconfigurable attenuators, phase shifters. And for the first time, we will show you how we can make it possible to use this technology to make reconfigurable acoustic wave filters, such as so filters, for example. So when we talk about switch, switch really is the basic building component of any microwave or millimeter wave device. Uh, you name it, you talk about phase shifters, tunable delay line, tunable filter, impedance matching network. If you want to route signals, you control, uh, uh, select certain bands, you need to use switches. And when it comes to switches, we don't have much. We have only three types of technology. The semiconductor, there are different types, of course, of semiconductor switches, uh, particularly SOI now is just the main uh, uh, technology for uh, uh, microwave uh, uh, switches. We have the MIB switches, and the new technology we are talking about here is the PCM technology. And when we talk about switch, the switch performance is, is, is very key and very important. We need to know about it, which is insertion loss, isolation, DC power consumption, and linearity. Now, when you see here on the on the left side showing the component on the uh, on the right side showing the component on the left side it shows the subsystems which you can make use of these components so we have been forming full duplex systems antenna matching signal rounding interference cancellation the all need of these components which are built using switches using switches so you can see a wide range of subsystems require the use of switches. Now, when we talk about particularly for 5G, uh, when we have a millimeter wave, need to use millimeter wave. So we have the, the, the so-called sub six gigahertz. It's actually 400 megahertz up to 7125 frequency range one. Still people call it sub six gig. And the millimeter wave, 24 uh, to 52.6 gigahertz, but here, the PCM technology shine, shine over any, over the semiconductor technology, as we will show you. And of course, it can be used in main, like for beam forming, the full duplex. I'm going to address uh, some applications for uh, potentially for full duplex. And here, like the, the general, the basic building block for millimeter beam forming network, you can see if it shifters in an A, PA. Well, Right now, this is done using semiconductor technology, which is great. Maybe at 28 gigahertz, but as you go higher in frequency, uh, things become a little bit semiconductor, still the performance degrade. So possibly P 
PCM technology can be used. You can make fish shifters, tuners, and the, they can be integrated with the PA and LNA on a, on a second layer. And also, possibly, they can be monolithically integrated together. Uh, as we will show you uh, later on, uh, there is a company in the US called Tower Semiconductor. They build, they integrate uh, PCM switches with CMOS devices, so you can have monolithic integration. Uh, so you can have one chip, which you have the LNA, PA, made in semiconductor, and the rest made in PCM technology. Now, full duplex is a very interesting system. It's one of the main uh, basic building block or potential building block of 5G systems, uh, where, uh, as we know, most transceivers use uh, frequency for the receive different from the transmit. For full duplex system, the receive channel and transmit channel use the same frequency. But obviously, there is tremendous tremendous interference from the transmit side to the receive side. So that needs to be canceled. And you can have RF cancellation circuit, which consists of fish shifters, tunable attenuators, tunable delay line. And all of them can be integrated on a single chip, in a single chip, and be able to provide uh, the, the, the cancellation. And I just want to mention that they have to be tunable because the signal comes back and there is a delay. So you have to use tunable and you have to use different bands as well. So they have to be tunable component using switches. Also, you know, if you use a circulator here, the circulator have a limited isolation, typically 20 dB. By having tunable matching network, you can effectively increase the, the, the circulator isolation by 40 dB, meaning that the effective isolation you see from that circulator is 40 dB. Basically, the idea is that is if there is interference because limited isolation from the transmit side to the receive side, now what you can do, the signal when it reflects back, okay, then you, you can basically uh, adjust the reflection such that it cancel what's coming through the limited isolation, okay? And that will allow you to take care of the multi-pass reflections and as well the 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 which can cause interference as well because they are at the same frequency and as well the interference from having the receiver and transmit on the same board and uh, you know so that's 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 also a, a potential application of, uh, of of PCM technology but really really the most the most important advantage of PCM technology is that it's easily amenable to monolithic integration with RF circuits. So for example, you can make here intelligent surface, intelligent reflect or transmit service. You can have these tiles, each tile is about say five inch, four inch, and you can integrate the antenna with the PCM elements. Uh, this basically could be meta type, meta, meta structures, periodic arrays, and you can integrate them with switches to be able to design intelligent reflect and transmit service. And that's that's really one of the potential application of this technology because the, it's easy, very easy to integrate PCM technology with RF circuits. You cannot do that with CMOS. You can do it potentially with MEMS, but still a little bit tough than PCM. Now, so let's talk, what is PCM? What is the phase change material? First, digital material is not something new. What's new here is that we are using it for RF applications. But PCM technology has been used for years for memory application. And it's basically material which exhibit reversible transition between crystalline and amorphous state, meaning between the metallic state and insulator state. So you can have the material here in crystalline state with very, very low resistivity, say to to micro ohm meter and by this is in crystalline state now in order to get it to amorphous state the insulator state all you need to apply uh, a pulse the red pulse here which you can get it into the amorphous state if it's already in amorphous state all you need to get it back to crystalline state you apply the blue pulse here 
But what's unique, what's unique about this technology, which way better than semiconductor technology in the sense it latches, it latches. So after you apply the pulse, that's it. It stays as it is. You don't have to keep the DC power as the case for semiconductor switches or as the case for web switches. So this is one of the unique features as well of PCM technologies. That's why people using it for memory applications. And really, the, the, it's really interesting to look at the, the, the history of uh, phase change material. It's interesting to know that, you know, it has been referred to or discovered in 1917. There's a famous paper here by Alan Tower Waterman, where he, he noticed that there is a, a polymer, a molybdenum disulfide, MOS2, has a negative coefficient of resistance with temperature. Most material, as you increase the temperature, the resistivity increase. But he found the MOS2, uh, basically, when you heat it, when you heat it or you apply current to it, the resistivity goes down. And um, he basically had a sample of this and he applied current and he found the resistivity goes down, demonstrating a negative coefficient of resistance with temperature. And in his paper, he showed that, well, he defined the resistance in two forms, high resistance and low resistance. But really the one who has been uh, credited for, uh, for PCM switches for memory applications, and in general, for switches, is uh, uh, Stanford uh, of Zhensky here, where he published a key paper in 1968, where he demonstrated a reversible switching uh, PCM switches, where, and he used an alloy of tellurium, arsenic, and silicon, and germanium. Uh, the, the compound we use for RF application is uh, uh, GETE, germanium to right. Uh, but there are lots, there's a family of materials which can be used uh, for switching. Now, as I said, as I said, really, the PCM is not something new, it has been used, and uh, you can see papers here in 2010s for memory applications, all reported, which shows here resistance. However, and you see here as well, Intel, Intel has a feature here, Intel PCM memory was released in 2007. However, in 2017, however, there is a big difference between using PCM for as a switch for memory application and PCM as a switch for RF application. For memory application, you need the own resistance to be high, the use high, and you need the ratio between the off state resistance and the on state resistance not to be so high. In RF, we need the own resistance to be very low and the ratio between the uh, the off-state resistance to the on-state resistance to be high in order to get low insertion loss and high isolation. So also the type of material, it's from the same family of materials, but they use different materials. We use here germanium to write, uh, they use uh, antimony to write, it's GST. Uh, nevertheless, it's the same from the same family of uh, material. Now, so what is the switch? Very easy to make a switch, to make an RF switch. So you can see here, this is a coplanar line. This is an input port and this is output port. And you can see in details here, there is the material here. It's the GETE material. The GETE material, which is a PCM material, germanium to write. And underneath of it, we have an insulator layer and then a heater, micro heater. So you can see here, this is the input port, this is the output port, and there is, uh, there, there is uh, over the GET material, and underneath there is insulator, and there is a heater, which could be tungsten, and this is the two pad for actuation, for applying the pulse. So that, this is RF port, RF port, and this is for applying the pulse. Now the switch here looks to you large. It's two, two, 240 micron by 650 micron. But this is, for us, we do it that way so we can test it in the lab. We test it in our proper station, so we have to have pads to do testing. In reality, the switch itself, 
can be, it's quite small. It's roughly 20 microns by 20 microns. So that allow you to integrate well, many of them, many of them on a, on a, on a, on a single uh, device. So this is a 3D structure of the device. And this is a 2D structure, basically a photo of the device. So uh, the, yes, the structure look easy. The, the process of fabricating that is a little bit involved, but it is way, way much easier than making maps because I've been developing, fabricating maps in my lab for years, and I've been fabricating PCM switches for the past eight years or seven years. So I can tell you, attest to you that it's much easier than fabricating MEMS switches. So this is a process, it's fabricated in our lab. It's about eight layer process. I'm not gonna go through the details, but basically you have the, the high resistive silicon substrate and you have the tungsten, we use it for heater. And we have the germanium to right here. We have the silicon oxide used in here. We have aluminum nitride. We use it for insulation. And we have gold we're using for the metallization for the RF circuits. But if you look, if you look at the device here, the final components after all said and done, you're going the steps. So, so a graduate students can perhaps spend 10 days or two weeks in the lab in our clean room to fabricate uh, this device. Uh, but you see here the you see the tungsten here, the heater, and then on the top of it, you see aluminum nitride, the blue uh, layer here for insulation. Okay, and then the GETE, and then we have basically the contact to for gold for that. So just basically the gold contact the GETE. So the material here, this is the junction. This is the junction. In the crystalline state, acts like a, a low resistivity metal, so thus connection between the two input port and output port in the amorphous state, effectively insulator, so it provides uh, isolation. And as you can see, this is wafer developed in our lab. You can make hundreds of devices on, on a very, very small component. Effectively, uh, two inch by two inch, you can make thousands of, 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 of those switches. What's interesting here is the performance, is the performance. Look at it. This is a switch measured up to 60 gigahertz, actually up to 67 gigahertz. And you can see that's insertion loss. Say at 40 gigahertz, we are talking here, what we're talking here about 0.28 dB, 0.28 dB insertion loss, okay? Even at 60 gigahertz, we are talking about something like close to less than 0.4 dB insertion loss. You can see here the, the retail loss, retail loss is great over close to over 20 dB up to 67 gigahertz. Isolation, there's a little bit, uh, degrades a little bit as you go in higher frequency, but there's a trade-off. There's a trade-off uh, between actuation and isolation. The isolation is limited because of the proximity of the heater close to the RF circuit. So there's parasitic capacitance and all of that. Nevertheless, uh, still reasonably good, close to 18 dB up to 60 gigahertz. Now, if you compare, if you compare that, that in a quantitative way, the semiconductor switches versus MEMS and PCM, this is uh, three switches we know. And if you define the figure of merit, which is one over two pi R on times C off, R on is the on resistor, C off is the off capacitors. You can see semiconductor switches have less than one terahertz. By the way, the higher the value, the figure of merit, the better is the switch, because that tells you that the switch has low loss and has higher isolation. MEM switches give you really great figure of merits, amazing figure of merits. Nevertheless, they are still moving parts. There are there are still uh, issues people reacting on that. But there are two commercial companies now. Uh, selling uh, commercial MEM switch is analog devices and uh, Menlo Micro, they, 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 they sell commercial MEM switches. So they have great performance. PCM switches is, is getting there. We achieved in our, so far in our lab 14 terahertz for the figure of it. So we are getting there at least to achieve, to reach capacitive MEMS switches. However, the, disadva the advantage 
the advantage of PCM over MEMS, three things. First of all, it has a latching, a latching capability, a latching capability. So once you apply the pulse, that's it. You don't have to keep it, the pulse. Secondly, it is uh, uh, amenable to integration, to integration of, of, um, uh, of many uh, integrations with RF circuits. In, you can, with, particularly with antennas, with, with, with large circuits, you can make a bunch of circuits easily integrated monolithically with uh, PCM switches. Uh, uh, so, uh, in the third thing, it is the cost of fabrications and uh, the reliability, you don't have moving parts, even though MEM switches now are quite, quite reliable. Now, so we'll show you here some of the performance of the PCM switches we developed. So these PCM switches, as, as we know, we are a university environment. Our focus uh, is not really to make a switch which you can, you know, meet all the requirement. We make a switch to demonstrate the concept and make devices out of it to show their performance and their size. So I'm going to show you some performance done in our lab, but I'm going to show you later on performance which achieved by uh, uh, professional foundries like uh, uh, the same. Uh, I'll show you in a few minutes some of the the performance achieved by some uh, professional foundry. Okay, this guitar semiconductor. So what we did here, people wonder what is the uh, uh, what is the power handling capability of the switch? Because that's the first thing many people ask about. So we tested this switch. You can see this is the input power and this is output power. This is the switch is in the on state. And you can see what happens is that roughly when it goes up to 36 dBm, the switch fails. So roughly you're talking here about 4 watt of, <coughs> 4 watt of, uh, when the switch is on state, it fails. Okay, if you wanna leave margin, it probably will go roughly two watt or so. Now, it's interesting when the switch is in off state, in the meaning is an insulator, the failure happens actually at lower power. So we found here the failure happened at 22 p.m. at 22 dBm. This is a low value we achieved, but as again, as I mentioned, there is a tower. Semiconductor achieved about uh, 30, 33 dBm uh, for for the switch and for the PCM uh, switch. So one can say PCM switches roughly can handle around two two watt for either in the on state or in the off state. Linearities, linearities again. We developed, we tested, this is the test setup, which we've done in my lab. We measured just the IP3 of, uh, of the switch. And in our case, we got 41 dBm, 40 dBm. Remember, we developed the switches as well for prototyping. I mean, if we optimize them further, we can get much better performance in our lab. And you can see it's about 41 dBm. Uh, tower semiconductor demonstrated around 65 dBm which is really better in my view than semiconductor devices, so high. And also the switching speed, the switching speed, that's another question people ask about. What is the switching speed of PCM switches? We tested that in our lab as well. And again, based on our devices, we, 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 we achieved. We got for, uh, in one state, uh, in one state when it's, um, from the off to the on, you require 1.1 microsecond. However, from the on, when the switch in the on state, you switch it to the off state, it require a pulse of two, roughly 250 nanoseconds. So, so in our case, we got, basically the switching speed will be limited either in off state or the, or the on state. So in our case, we got one point, one microsecond, while tower semiconductor got roughly 700 nanosecond in both cases. And there's research going on to even lower the switching speed to a few hundred nanoseconds. 
Now, reliability. Reliability. We tested the reliability of the switches fabricated in our lab. The switches fabricated in our lab. And um, you can see here, we tested them for one million cycle. One million cycles. You can see very, very, very small changes in the resistance, uh, whether in the on state, in the on state or <clears throat> in the off state. Again, in our lab, we demonstrated one million because of it's a university lab. Uh, tower semiconductor demonstrated 10 billion, 10 billion cycles, 10 billion cycles of, uh, of switching without failure for PCM technology. Okay. And again, what we demonstrated here is just a prototype down developed by graduate students. Now, what's interesting as well, people wonder about the heating aspect. What happens when you have a device and you heat it? Because really the temperature, you it goes so high when you try, uh, you apply a pulse to the microheater to switch your material from one state to another. So we have uh, a thermal imaging device at the University of Waterloo, which allow us to optimize the heater performance and the junction performance as well. So we can measure really what's happening in the heater as we increase the, the, the power or the, the pulse weights and the, the voltages uh, for it. Yeah, and allow us to see if you have a switch, if you have a switch, and if you apply pulse to switch it from one state to another, Yes, in that area, local area, there will be significant amount of temperature rise. You can see it can go up to 500 C Celsius, or it can even go higher. But the question is, how about surrounding area? We're using the thermal imaging device. You can see here for a pulse, which is eight volt and 1.2 microsecond, you see within an area 14 micron, Width, you don't see the temperature goes down significantly. Even if you use 200 nanosecond and high uh, 12 voltage, this is when you go from amorphous to crystalline, you will see uh, still, yeah, maybe 16 micron and store. Even if you go extremely high uh, voltage pulse, 200 nanosecond, uh, within 150 micron or 200 microns, the temperature goes down. So that's allow you, you can integrate these switches close to each other with no issues. Now, the first thing we looked about application of, of, uh, of this technology is uh, for making uh, variable capacitors because variable capacitor used in many applications, particularly for cell phone, uh, there is impedance matching network uh, in every cell phone to deal with uh, impedance antenna variation and it consists with variable capacitors. And I'm worked for many years on MEMS, so I'm familiar with what's happening. There were two companies, uh, it's called Wisepry and uh, Cavendish, which bought right now by, uh, by uh, uh, Corvo. Uh, they were making MEMS variable capacitors. And of course, semiconductor, Pergamon here has a chip, which gives you variable capacitors. And of course, you can use BST, the ferroelectric material, barium strontium titanate, for example, Blackberry phones, they were using BST. So we thought we can make capacitors, variable capacitors, we indeed we make it. As you can see, the chip here consists of MIM capacitors and switches. Four MIM capacitor and switches. And by switching the capacitors, the switches on and off, you can get 16 states for the capacitors. So you can make impedance a tuner. So the fabrication process is the same. Here we use the glass substrate um, rather than high safety silicon, but uh, you know, uh, I have several students who prefer particular substrate uh, for his applications. And see, this is the whole chip. You can see here is a variable capacitor, 600 micron by 900 microns. And you can see here, this is the measured results. You can variable capacitor from half a picofarad to three picofarad. The Q, the Q was. Uh, was okay, it was about uh, 20 or 30, but there was some still room for improving it. Also, also we made uh, switches, uh, switches, um, as I mentioned, uh, 
uh, when I'm talking here about switches, I'm talking about the SPST switch, I'm talking multi port switches. Uh, we are familiar with the transfer type switch, which has four ports. A transfer type switch has it can state one connect between one and two and three and four simultaneously, and or between one and two and two and three simultaneously. There is another switch we call a T type switch. Uh, this switch is quite unique because it has three states. So the two states similar to uh, the one known transfer switch, but it has additional state, which give you as well connection between one and three and two and four. Having that switch as a building, as a build, as a basic building block, allow you to make a very uh, comprehensive uh, subsystem or comprehensive devices. For example, um, so we made the switch here, we call it the T-switch. As you can see here, the switch, which is has four ports and has three states, has a size of 0.55 millimeter by 0.5 mm, five millimeter. 550 microns by 550 microns. Can make you four port switch. And here is the device, you can see works up to 60 gigahertz. It's just insertion loss so low, uh, retail loss, not bad, isolation is good here because we use two switches for each pass. Uh, we have several papers published in NTT transaction on that. You can refer details on those switches. For example, here we make a redundancy switch matrix. These type of switch matrices are used a lot uh, when we have systems which you cannot rely completely on them and you need to route the signal in case of failure. So for example, here in the case where you have, a, you have say several receiver and you know, you can in case even two of them fail, you still you can route the signal and you still use the operational five. So we make the whole circuit here. This is really, really quite small. It's close to about two and a half millimeter by roughly, uh, by roughly one and a half millimeter in, um, in, in size. We made also cross bar switch matrices. Cross bar switch matrices uh, are very, very interesting switch matrices. We have been using them, uh, uh, industry using them. I, I used to work uh, in industry in the 90s and we used to make them out of semiconductor. The switch matrix was quite large. We used to make them in hybrid fashion, of course, at that time. But basically this switch matrix, it has several ports on the, say in the vertical ports here and the horizontal ports. You can route any of these ports to any of these ports. So which is quite unique, but here, as you can see, this is built in our lab, the whole lab. And you can see the scale here shows you 50 micro that give you a good idea about the whole switch matrix like that. Attenuators, attenuators. The beauty about this technology is miniaturization, miniaturization. And then even the biasing and all of that is much less complicated than than semiconductor switches. So here we have an attenuator, it's digital attenuator. So we use SP2T and attenuators, which monolithically integrated, at basically chip resistors, integrated with the switches on a single chip, on a single chip. So you can have uh, 16 states attenuator. So this uh, digital attenuator was uh, built in our lab. Uh, you can see it's, uh, it's quite small here that give you the scale here. 100 micro, 100 micro, and you can see here the switching state. Of course, because we operate that at millimeter wave frequencies, millimeter wave frequencies, so we have to add some capacitance and some inductors to uh, to be able to get the wide band uh, because uh, the, the the fixed attenuators basically have several fixed attenuators when you switch between them. So we, we, we have to play with them a little bit to allow to get us wide band, but the end result, as you can still, you can see here a small chip, uh, which can give you as a digital attenuator. Fish shifter, fish shifter, which is, we developed several type of fish shifter. This is one we show here, which is a three bit fish shifters. Uh, and one of the issue of fish shifters, or particularly uh, the digital fish shifter is that the different states have different insertion loss. And that's, if you make that traditionally with semiconductor, 
or uh, use that concept of three bed. Of course, there are different concepts of fish shifter. Or use MEMS, you see the longer lens here will give you larger insertion loss. The lowest state which goes through here will give you the lowest insertion loss. So what we added here, we made use of the PCM. We added as well a PCM line here. So in case we're gonna go through the, uh, the smallest phase, so what we do, we add more loss <laughs> just to maintain uh, the loss of all the states. So, and you can see here the, the, the results. You can see here, this is uh, the simulated, this is a measured. This is at mainly from 26 gigahertz up to 34 gigahertz. You can see in social loss roughly around from four to 4.5 dB. And again, there is room for improvement. This is just prototype students make, they publish papers on that and we'll get over with it. Of course, if you work harder on that, we can improve way, way much more the performance that we can direct it or design it direct exactly for the band we need. Now, so I showed you some of the performances which we achieved in our lab, but as I said, it's a, it's, it's a university lab. Uh, we have a great facility in Waterloo, but still it's run by students, really. So this is uh, this is Tower Semiconductor and Tower Semiconductor has a unique, unique capability because they integrate the PCM with uh, with, uh, with RFSI, uh, RFSI, and they have different semiconductor technology. So they have different uh, idea on making very neat devices, but you can see the performance, they caught it here, 10 billion cycles and 700 nanosecond and 60 DD, DBM IP3. So which is really extremely very good performance. And, um, I'm currently actually attending International Microwave Symposium in Denver. And uh, there was a workshop at the beginning of this week. And these results, I participated in that workshop with a talk, but as well, uh, Tower Semiconductor participated with a talk and showed this latest performance, which is exact, very, very impressive in my view. Now, so I talked about phase change material. There is another, there is another type of material, we call it phase transition material. Phase transition material like, uh, like vanadium oxide. And this material as well have been used for optical application. If you search the literature under vanadium oxide, we find wide range of uh, applications uh, of VO2 for optical, for optical application. Basically the material, again, it changes the resistivity when you heat it, but it changes as well the reflective index. That's why it's been used in optical application. Now, this material switch from high resistivity to low resistivity at 68 degree, at 60. Degree. There is a little bit of hysteresis here, but it doesn't matter because if you operate between here and here, between the two states, you are away from the hysteresis. But the temperature here at 68, and it does not latch, similar to the PCM material, similar to the free change material, that's why I call it phase transition material. And, but it has, it has interesting application as well. Uh, so we made switches out of it. So you can see here, for example, a fabrication process similar to what we used in PCM. And this is a switch reported at 40 gigahertz. And uh, you can see excellent performance. We make a series type and shunt type switches using uh, vanadium oxide but they have to apply they are not they don't have a latching capability and the beauty about this material you can use it as attenuator because if you look at this characteristic in this transistor and this area the resistance changes mostly so you can potentially use it as attenuator uh, and we here we used millimeter wave attenuators we have a couple of hybrids back to back and we have here the VO2 materials and we apply DC voltage. So we change the resistance. So as you see, which when you change the voltage, you effectively change the resistance of the VO2 material. So we can make variable attenuator. We made it at uh, K band and at uh, KA band. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about here, 
which is very interesting, very exciting, because in my view, this is also another, uh, uh, another device which shine or, uh, or demonstrate the, the advantage of PCM technology is to make is to make tunable surface acoustic wave devices uh, acoustic acoustic wave devices as you know uh, these acoustic wave devices used to make filters and each cell phone has 50 of those 60 filters so the ability to have a switchable filter so allow you potentially to eliminate the number of filters here we demonstrated two things there is here the plexer where we can apply switches it's monolithically integrated with the with the saw filter. So this is fabricated in our lab where it's again, we get we get the wafer with uh, less, uh, lithium tantinate as a piezoelectric substrate. And we start from that and we build on the top of it, the PCM switches. So you can get switch here with various, uh, diplexer with various state. That was published last year, this year, we have very, very interesting paper, which in my view, the first to be ever done, demonstrated, is just monolithic, monolithically switchable uh, acoustic wave device where we integrate the PCM switches with the fingers here, with the fingers here. And as you can see, uh, here we replace the switches with metal and, uh, and you can see the resonator switch. This is just demonstrated, tell you the concept works. And we made a filter here, as you can see that it works as switchable, uh, switchable uh, so so filter. The, the the beauty about these things is that as what we have each each resonator has two hundred as you see here. Each resonator has two hundred fifty six fifty six fingers fifty six fingers. We we'll call it IDT. And we use 64 switches, 64 switches located at those fingers. There is no way, there is no way because these filters are extremely, extremely small. There is no way you can use semiconductor to do it because these switches are so small, they can be easily integrated with, uh, with the saw devices or we can use BAMS for that. So this is a very interesting application of, of uh, PCM technology. And this is a measured result for the resonator. And this is a complete filter, which integrated, built in our lab, and will be actually presented tomorrow in IMS uh, 2022 in Denver. To conclude, PCM technology is certainly a promising technology, but it takes time to develop a technology to make really a product out of it. Uh, we have seen that in MEMS. MEMS now is becoming a product. Um, uh, hopefully that will happen as well at PCM, but certainly uh, there is more research need, need to be carried out as well uh, in this area. And this is conclude my presentation and I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mansour. And of course, uh, that was really a very inspiring talk as well on microwave and millimeter wave PCM devices for future communications. Now we have some questions uh, over here from the audience, starting with uh, this one. And uh, it's, what is typical size of micro heater and how many switches can be served by a heater? Is heater integratable with the switches? Uh, Professor, what are your thoughts on this one? Okay, that's, that's a very good question. If you go here, you see the heater is actually underneath here. So you can see a small gap. So I'm saying the GET material, the GET material here is about 20 micron by roughly by 20 micron. The heater is much smaller than that. It's much smaller than that. It's quite thin. Now it is, it is attached. It is attached to larger pad because we tested in our lab. We have DC props, so we have to do that. But in system, in system, you don't need that large pad. You need just very thin, very thin line for for the heater. And also, you can, if we look at that T switch here, you can see you can actually activate several switches with using one heater. Like here, 
uh, this figure maybe is, doesn't show clearly, but for if you want to connect from here to here, there is one switch here and one switch here. So we use one heater for it. So a heater can effectively, based on the layout, used to actuate several switches, but it's so tiny, so tiny. Thank I you hope so that much answers the question. Yes, thank you so much for uh, helping to answer that first question. We've got a few more questions uh, from our audience. Thank you so much for sending the questions. And the next question is, PCM off-state power is limited to 20 dBm. What is the cause and any way to improve it in the future? How about heater size compared with PCM resistor unit? How would you address this question, Professor? Okay, uh, this is as well. This is again the, <laughs> the worry of us who are researching working on PCM. And as I said, I uh, this is developed in my lab and we achieved 22 dBm. Uh, as well, I checked with my colleagues who are professors as well. Uh, they tell me uh, around that 22, 20 dBm. But I was really impressed when I saw the results uh, from um, Tower Semiconductor, where they demonstrated actually that in the off state, in the off state, you can get easily uh, 33 or 34 dBm. So one can say that set of the art right now is about roughly one can say 33 dBm both ways, whether the switch is on state or in the off state. Now, why why in the off state happens in that? Uh, somehow the, the capacitance is so low, so, so it's, there is tremendous voltage on it, so there is the, the material switch back inside the material and switch to the own state. So you, see, you need really uh, some work on that area to improve it, to improve it further. But what we hear, what we hear from some people like, if you can get PCM switch to work for three, uh, to work for four watts or so, that will be great. So it's getting there, you know. As I mentioned, Thank the so technology much. started just a few years ago for RF applications, okay? And uh, still more research need to be done. Thank you so much, Professor. We've got a couple more questions to go. Uh, our next question is this one. At this micro level, how does the parasitic capacitance of the connected components affect the performance? Okay, that's that's yeah, that's really the, the ultimate thing as well, because you can. This is a junction. I didn't have it here in this presentation, but we, if you look at our paper, we put actually equivalent circuit equivalent circuit for this junction. As you can see, it considered from little inductors and lots of parasitic capacitance because you have lots of parasitic capacitance coming particularly between input and output and uh, and, and and the heaters, okay? And there is there is a trade-off. There is a trade-off uh, on the insulator uh, layer, which isolate the heater from the, the metallization for the RF metallization, okay? Because one can do, one can make the insulator layer to have uh, quite thick, okay? That will reduce the parasitic capacitance. That will allow you to push the frequency uh, higher, higher. And there is also potential uh, to use a material like we use aluminum nitride, which has better thermal conductivity. So allow us to use thicker layer and the steel provide the heat to the GET material. I can tell you, I can tell you, there is a company called Teledyne Relay. It's a US company, Teledyne Relay. They developed a switch using VO2, VO2 material. And they demonstrated the switch up to 200 gigahertz, 200 gigahertz. I repeat that again, up to 200 gigahertz as a switch. And they managed really to control the parasitic, but they use VO2 because VO2 is much easier to actuate than the GETA. So the switch was not of a latching type, but they managed to achieve up to 200 gigahertz because they managed to control 
all the parasitic elements in the switch junction. Thank you so much, Prof. And uh, I've got to tell you that uh, our audience this morning is really participative as they were yesterday. And we've got another four more questions in the queue. Let's see if we can finish them in the next nine minutes. <laughs> the next question is, does yeah. the temperature have an effect on it and how to compensate for it? Okay, yeah, that's also one of the issues we discussed actually in, uh, in the workshop. In the workshop, uh, uh, it was held actually Monday, just a few days ago. Yes, is that is there, there were some reports on that the the change of the performance of uh, of the device when it operate at, at at high temperature. Obviously, one maybe uh, that's we haven't done our test that ourselves. We have not tested the switch over temperature, but that's that's perhaps will uh, will will impact. The, the voltage level of the pulse. So that can be controlled, you know, like it can simply in a system wise, you can look at the temperature and maybe be able to change the low voltage level of the pulse that can take care of the things because it's all heating, you know, the pulse provide heating and the environment provide heating. So you need to take that into consideration. So that with engineering design that can be uh, achieved. To, 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 wow. to get the switch working over a wide range of temperature. Wonderful. Next question we have is, how high in frequency PCM switches can go? Yes, I, I uh, yeah, this is, this is really the, because now when you talk about 6G, people talk about terahertz, up terahertz, uh, can we use these things on that? And that's actually the line uh, to the done relays when they try to target this application by developing 200 gigahertz. We demonstrated, we demonstrated up to 67 gigahertz. Uh, I think we, the reason is, uh, particularly because it's easy to use for me to use uh, the 67 gigahertz key site device. Uh, I have extender, I can connect them to try to see the performance of the switch. Uh, beyond that, and I think these switches can be potentially uh, easily perhaps reach up to 100 gigahertz or so. And with more engineering work and um, material side, basically selecting the insulator type to remove the parasitic capacitance, we can possibly, we can possibly get it to uh, 150 gigahertz or 200 gigahertz. Of course, the performance will degrade, but, 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 but still, you will get something which cannot be done by, by any other technology, by semiconductor, for example. It will be certainly much better than semiconductor at that frequency. Thank you so much, Professor, for all these insightful answers to our audience's questions. We still have a couple more. And the next one for you is this. Are there other materials besides GST that can be used for switching? Your thoughts? Yes, yes, indeed, yes. Like, uh, like ourselves, we are using GET material, uh, many research group as well using GET, power semiconductor using GET material, but uh, uh, there is uh, uh, there is an organization on the West Coast, they doing uh, that, they were using GST. It's uh, basically a... Uh, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a material from the same family. The advantage of this material is that is the requirement on heater is a bit less than on the heater design is a bit less than uh, uh, if you use GET material because the temperature required uh, to switch from one state to another using GST, okay, it's less, but there is a price to pay the price likely to pay is that the own state resistance is a little bit higher than the GET material. So there is a family, a family of materials from the same group, uh, basically changing alloy, basically, uh, and based on the trade-off analysis, you can tailor the material, uh, you know, uh, 
to the application you want. Like for example, the people in memory they use the same family of material as well, but they use GST because, and they use particular alloy of GST, particular uh, particular percentage of, uh, of that alloy, because they don't worry about the own state resistance. For them, actually, they need high, high value of the own state resistance. But for us as RF engineer, we need very low uh, own resistance. Thank you so much, Prof. And uh, we move on. I think this is probably the last question for this session, and it's this. What is the impact of operating temperature on the switch performance? Would you be able to explain? I, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, that's what I just mentioned a few minutes ago is that is possibly is that uh, some people demonstrated that the performance degrade uh, slightly when you operate at high temperatures, but uh, still more research need to be verified. I, I didn't hear the same issue from uh, people who work with professional foundry. Uh, in my view, it can be uh, controlled because all it needed is just basically adjust the level of the voltage pulse, uh, the level of the voltage, uh, activation pulse, and duration such as that to account for all that temperature range. So I don't see, in my view, a major issue in that area. Thank Definitely you so much, more Professor. research need to be done. Need to be done. Yeah, Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mansour, for that deep discussion on uh, microwave, millimeter wave, PCM devices for future communications, and of course, uh, answering all our audience's questions as well. Thank you so much.